Gas Station Carnivals by Thomas Ligotti Outside the walls of the Crimson Cabaret was a world of rain and darkness. At intervals, whenever someone entered or exited through the front door of the club, one could actually see the steady rain and was allowed a brief glimpse of the darkness. Inside it was all amber light, tobacco smoke, and the sound of the raindrops hitting the windows, which were all painted black. On such nights, as I sat at one of the tables in that drab little place, I was always filled with an infernal merriment, as if I were waiting out the apocalypse and could not care less about it. I also like to imagine that I was in the cabin of an old ship during a really vicious storm at sea, or in the club car of a luxury passenger train that was being rocked on its rails by ferocious winds and hammered by a demonic rain. Sometimes, when I was sitting in the Crimson Cabaret on a rainy night, I thought of myself as occupying a waiting room for the abyss, which, of course, was exactly what I was doing, and between sips from my glass of wine or cup of coffee, I smiled sadly and touched the front pocket of my coat, where I kept my imaginary ticket to oblivion. However, on that particular rainy November night, I was not feeling very well. My stomach was slightly queasy, as if signaling the onset of a virus or even food poisoning. Another source for my malaise, I thought to myself, might well have been my long-standing nervous condition, which fluctuated from day to day but was always with me in some form and manifested itself in a variety of symptoms both physical and psychic. I was in fact experiencing a faint sensation of panic although this in no way ruled out the possibility that the queasiness of my stomach was due to a strictly physical cause, either viral or toxic. Neither did it rule out a third possibility which I was trying to ignore at that point in the evening. Whatever the etiology of my stomach disorder, I felt the need to be in a public place that night, so that if I should collapse, an eventuality I often feared, there would be people around who might attend to me, or at least shuttle my body off to the hospital. At the same time, I was not seeking close contact with any of these people, and I would have been bad company in any case, sitting there in the corner of the club drinking mint tea and smoking mild cigarettes out of respect for my ailing stomach. For all these reasons, I had brought my notebook with me that night and had it lying open on the table before me, as if to say that I wanted to be left alone to mull over some literary matters. But when Stuart Quisser entered the club at approximately ten o'clock, the sight of me sitting at a corner table with my open notebook, drinking mint tea and smoking mild cigarettes so that I might stay on top of the situation with my queasy stomach, did not in the least discourage him from walking directly to my table and taking the seat across from me. A waitress came over to us, Quisser ordered some kind of white wine, while I asked for another cup of mint tea. So now it's mint tea, Quisser said as the girl left us. I'm surprised you're showing your face around here, I said by way of reply. I thought I might try to make up with the old crimson woman. Make up? That doesn't sound like you. Nevertheless, have you seen her tonight? No, I haven't. You humiliated her at that party. I haven't seen her since, not even in her own club. I don't know if you're aware of this, but she's not someone you want to have as an enemy. Meaning what? he asked. Meaning that she has connections you know absolutely nothing about. And of course, you know all about it. I've read your stories. You're a confessed paranoid, so what's your point? My point, I said is that there's hell in every handshake, never mind an outright and humiliating insult. I had too much to drink, that's all. You called her a deluded no-talent. Quisser looked up at the waitress as she approached with our drinks, and he made a hasty hand signal to me for silence. When she was gone, he said, I happen to know that our waitress is very loyal to the Crimson Woman. She will very probably inform her about my visiting the club tonight, I wonder if she would be willing to act as a go-between with her boss to deliver a second-hand apology from me. Look around at the walls, I said. Quisser set down his glass of wine and scanned the room. 
Hmm, he said when he had finished looking. This is more serious than I thought. She's taken down all her old paintings, and the new ones don't look like her work at all. They're not. You humiliated her. And yet she seems to have done up the stage since I last saw it. New paint job or something. The so-called stage to which Quissa referred was a small platform in the opposite corner of the club. This area was entirely framed by four long panels, each of them painted with black and gold seagulls against a glossy red background. Various events occurred on this stage. Poetry readings, tableau vivant, playlets of sundry types, puppet shows, artistic slideshows, musical performances, and so on. That night, which was a Tuesday, the stage was dark. I observed nothing different about it and asked Quisser what he imagined he thought was new. I can't say exactly, but something seems to have been done. Maybe it's those black and gold ideographs or whatever they're supposed to be. The whole thing looks like the cover of a menu in a Chinese restaurant. You're quoting yourself, I said. What do you mean? The Chinese menu remark. You used that in your review of the Marsha Corker exhibit last month. Did I? I don't remember. Are you just saying you don't remember, or do you really not remember? I asked this question in the spirit of trivial curiosity, my queasy stomach discouraging the strain of any real antagonism on my part. I remember, all right? Which reminds me, there's something I wanted to talk to you about. It came to me the other day, and I immediately thought of you and your stuff, he said, gesturing toward my notebook of writings open on the table between us. I can't believe it's never come up before. You of all people should know about them. No one else seems to. It was years ago, but you're old enough to remember them. You've got to remember them. Remember what? I asked, and after the briefest pause he replied, The gas station carnivals. And he said these words as if he were someone delivering a punchline to a joke, the proud bringer of a surprising and profound hilarity. I was supposed to express an astonished recognition, that much I knew. It was not a phenomenon of which I was entirely ignorant, and memory is such a tricky thing. This, at least, is what I told Quisser. But as Quisser told me his memories, trying to arouse mine, I gradually realized the true nature and purpose of the so-called gas station carnivals. During this time it was all I could do to conceal how badly my stomach was acting up on me, queasy and burning. I kept telling myself, as Quisser was talking about his memories of the gas station carnivals, that I was certainly experiencing the onset of a virus, if in fact I had not been the victim of food poisoning. Quisser, nevertheless, was so caught up in his story that he seemed not to notice my agony. Quisser said that his recollections of the gas station carnivals derived from his early childhood. His family, meaning his parents and himself, would go on long vacations by car, often driving great distances, to a variety of destinations. Along the way, naturally, they would need to stop at any number of gas stations that were located in towns and cities, as well as those that they came upon in more isolated rural locales. These were the places, Quisser said, where one was most likely to discover those hybrid enterprises which he called gas station carnivals. Quisser did not claim to know when or how these specialized carnivals, or perhaps specialized gas stations, came into existence, nor how widespread they might have been. His father, whom Quisser believed would be able to answer such questions, had died some years ago, while his mother was no longer mentally competent, having suffered a series of psychic catastrophes not long after the death of Quisser's father. Thus, all that remained to Quisser was the memory of these childhood excursions with his parents, during which they would find themselves in some rural area, perhaps at the crossroads of two highways, and often, he seemed to recall, around sunset, and discover in this isolated location one of those curiosities which he described to me as gas station carnivals. They were invariably filling stations, Quisser emphasized, and not service stations, which might have facilities for doing extensive repairs on cars and other vehicles. There would be, in those days, four gas pumps at most, often only two, 
in some kind of modest building which usually had so many signs and advertisements applied to its exterior that no one could say if anything actually stood beneath them. Quisser said that as a child he always took special notice of the signs that advertised chewing tobacco, and that as an adult, in his capacity as an art critic, he still found the sight of chewing tobacco packages very appealing, and he could not understand why some artists had not successfully exploited their visual and imaginative qualities. It seemed to me, as we sat that night in the Crimson Cabaret, that this chewing gum material was intended to lend greater credence to Quisser's story. This detail was so vivid to him. But when I asked Quisser if he recalled any particular brands of chewing tobacco being advertised at these filling stations which had carnivals attached to them, he became slightly defensive, as if my question were intended to challenge the accuracy of his childhood recollection. He then shifted the focus of the issue I had raised by asserting that the carnival aspect of these places was not exactly attached to the gas station aspect, but that they were never very far away from each other, and there was definitely a commercial liaison between them. His impression, which had been instilled in him like some founding principle of a dream, was that a substantial purchase of gasoline allowed the driver and passengers of a given vehicle free access to the nearby carnival. At this point in his story, Quisser became anxious to explain that these gas station carnivals were by no means elaborate, quite the opposite, in fact. Situated on some empty stretch of land that stood alongside, or sometimes behind, a rural filling station, they consisted of only the remnants of fully-fledged carnivals, the bare bones of much larger and grander entertainments. There was usually a tall, arched entranceway with colored light bulbs that provided an eerie contrast to the vast and barren landscape surrounding it, especially around sunset, which was usually, or possibly always, when Quisser and his parents found themselves in one of these remote locales. The colorful illumination of a carnival entranceway created an effect that was both festive and sinister. But once a visitor had gained admittance to the actual grounds of the carnival, there came a moment of letdown at the thing itself, that spare assemblage of equipment that appeared to have been left behind by a traveling amusement park in the distant past. There were always only a few carnival rides, Quisser said, and these were very seldom in actual operation. He supposed that at some time they had been in functioning order, probably when they were first installed as an annex to the gas stations. But this period, he speculated, could not have lasted long, and no doubt at the earliest sign of malfunction each of the rides had been shut down. Quisser said that he himself had never been on a single ride at a gas station carnival, though he insisted that his father once allowed him to sit atop one of the wooden horses on a defunct merry-go-round. It was a miniature merry-go-round, Quisser told me, as if that gave his recollected experience an aura of meaning or substance. All the rides, it seemed, were miniature, he asserted, small-scale versions of carnival rides he had elsewhere known and had actually ridden upon. Beside the miniature merry-go-round, which never moved an inch and always stood dark and silent in a remote rural landscape. There would be a miniature Ferris wheel, no taller than a bungalow-style house, Quisser said, and sometimes a miniature tilt-a-whirl or a miniature roller coaster. And they were always closed down because once they had malfunctioned, if in fact any of them were ever in operation, they were never subsequently repaired. Possibly they never could be repaired, Quisser thought given the antiquated parts and mechanisms of these miniature carnival rides. Yet there was a single quite crucial amusement that one could almost always expect to see open to the public, or at least to those whose car had been filled with the requisite amount of gasoline and who were therefore free to pass through the brightly lit entranceway upon which the word carnival was emblazoned in colored lights against a vast and haunting sky at sundown somewhere out in a rural wasteland. Quisser posed to me a question. How could a place advertise itself as a carnival, even a gas station carnival, if it did not include that most vital carnivalesque feature, a sideshow? Perhaps there was some special law or ordinance regulating such matters, Quisser imagined out loud, 
an old statute of some kind that would have particular force in remote areas where certain traditions have an endurance unknown to urban centers. This would account for the fact that, except under extraordinary circumstances such as dangerously bad weather, there was always some type of sideshow performance at these gas station carnivals, even though everything else on the ground stood dark and damaged. Of course, these sideshows, as Quisser described them, were not terribly sophisticated, even by the standards of the average carnival, let alone those that served as commercial enticements for some out-of-the-way gas station. There would be only a single sideshow attraction at a given site, and outwardly they each presented the same image to the carnival's patrons, a small tent of torn and filthy canvas. At some point along the perimeter of the tent would be a loose flap of material through which Quisser and his parents, though sometimes only Quisser himself, would gain entrance to the sideshow. Inside the tent were a few wooden benches that had sunk a little bit into the hard dirt beneath them, and some distance away a small stage area that was raised perhaps just a foot or so above ground level. Illumination was provided by two ordinary floor lamps, one on either side of the stage, that were without lampshades or any other kind of covering, so that their bare light bulbs burned harshly and cast dramatic shadows throughout the interior of the tent. Quisser said that he always noticed the frayed electrical cords that trailed off from the base of each lamp and, by means of several extension cords, ultimately found a source of power at the gas station, that is, from within the small brick building which was obscured by so many signs advertising chewing tobacco and other products. When visitors to a gas station carnival entered the sideshow tent and took their places on one of the benches in front of the stage, they were not usually alerted to the particular nature of the performance or spectacle that they would witness. Quisser remarked that there was no marquee or billboard of any type that might offer such a notice to the carnival goers either before they entered the sideshow tent or after they were inside and seated on one of the old wooden benches. However, with one important exception, each of the performances or spectacles was much the same rigmarole. The audience would settle itself on the wooden benches, most of which were about to collapse or, as Quisser observed, were so unevenly sunk into the ground that it was impossible to sit on them, and the show would begin. The attractions varied from sideshow to sideshow, and Quisser said he was unable to remember all of the ones he had seen. He did recall what he described as the human spider. This was a very brief spectacle during which someone in a clumsy costume scuttled from one side of the stage to the other and back again, exiting through a slit at the back of the tent. The person wearing the costume, Quisser added, was presumably the attendant who pumped gas, washed windows, and performed various services around the filling station. In many sideshow performances, such as that of the hypnotist, Quisser remembered that a gas station attendant's uniform, greasy gray or blue coveralls, was quite visible beneath the performer's stage clothes. Quisser did admit that he was unsure why he designated this particular sideshow act the hypnotist, since there was no hypnotism involved in the performance, and of course no marquee or billboard existed either outside the tent or within it that might lead the public to expect any kind of mesmeric routines. The performer was simply clothed in a long, loose overcoat and wore a plastic mask, which was a plain, very pale replica of a human face with the exception that instead of eyes, or eye holes, there were two large discs with spiral designs painted upon them. The hypnotist would gesticulate chaotically in front of the audience for some moments, no doubt because his vision was obscured by the spiral-patterned discs over the eyes of his mask, and then stumble off stage. There were numerous other sideshow acts that Quisser claimed to have seen, including the dancing puppet, the Worm, the Hunchback, and Dr. Fingers. With one important exception, the routine was always the same. Quisser and his parents would enter the sideshow tent and sit upon one of the rotted benches, soon after which some performer would appear briefly on the small stage that was lit up by two ordinary floor lamps. The single deviation from this routine was an attraction that Quisser called the Showman. 
whereas every other sideshow act began and ended after Quisser and his parents had entered the special tent and seated themselves, the one called the showman always seemed to be in progress. As soon as Quisser stepped inside the tent, invariably preceding his parents, he claimed, he saw the figure standing perfectly still upon the small stage with his back to the audience. For whatever reason, there were never any other patrons when Quisser and his parents stopped at twilight and visited one of these gas station carnivals, with their second-hand defective amusements, eventually making their way into the sideshow tent. This situation did not seem strange or troubling to the young Quisser except on those occasions when he entered the sideshow tent and saw that it was the showman on stage with his back to a few rows of empty benches that looked as if they might break up altogether if one attempted to sit on them. Whenever faced with this scene, Quisser immediately wanted to turn around and leave the place. But then his parents would come pushing into the tent behind him, he said and before he knew it they would all be sitting on one of the benches in the very first row looking at the showman. His parents never knew how terrified he was of this peculiar sideshow figure, Quisser repeated several times. Furthermore, visiting these gas station carnivals, and especially taking in the sideshows, was all done for Quisser's benefit, since his father and mother would have preferred simply filling up the family car with gasoline and moving on toward whatever vacation spot was next on their itinerary. Quisser contended that his parents actually enjoyed watching him sit in terror before the showman, until he could not stand it any longer and asked to go back to the car. At the same time, he was quite transfixed by the sight of this sideshow character, who was unlike any other he could remember. There he was, Quisser said, standing with his back to the audience and wearing an old top hat and a long cape that touched the dirty floor of the small stage on which he stood. Sticking out from beneath the top hat were the dense and lengthy shocks of the showman's stiff red hair, Quisser said which looked like some kind of sickening vermin's nest. When I asked Quisser if this hair might actually have been a wig, deliberately testing his memory and imagination, he gave me a contemptuous look, as if to stress that I was not the one who had seen the stiff red hair. He was the one who had seen it sticking out from beneath the showman's old top hat. The only other features that were visible to the audience, Quisser continued, were the fingers of the showman which grasped the edges of his long cape. These fingers appeared to Quisser to be somehow deformed, curling together into little claws, and were a pale greenish color. Apparently, as Quisser viewed it, the entire stance of the figure was calculated to suggest that at any moment he might twirl about and confront the audience full face, his moldy fingers lifting up the edges of his cape, reaching to the height of his stiff red hair, yet the figure never budged. Sometimes it did seem to Quisser that the showman was moving his head a little to the left or a little to the right, threatening to reveal one side of his face or the other, playing a horrible game of peekaboo. But ultimately Quisser concluded that these perceived movements were illusory and that the showman was always posed in perfect stillness, a nightmarish mannequin that invited all kinds of imaginings by its very forbearance of any gesture. It was all a nasty pretense, Quisser said to me, and then paused to finish off his glass of wine. But what if he had turned around to face the audience? I asked. While awaiting his response, I sipped some of my mint tea, which did not seem to be doing much good for my queasy stomach, yet at the same time was causing no harm either. I lit one of the mild cigarettes that I was smoking on that occasion. Did you hear what I said? I said to Quisser, who had been looking toward the stage located in the opposite corner of the Crimson Cabaret. The stage is the same, I said to Quisser quite sternly, attracting some glances from persons sitting at the other tables in the club. The panels are the same and the designs on them are also the same. Quisser played nervously with his empty wine glass. When I was very young, he said, there was a certain occasion on which I would see the showman, but he wasn't in his natural habitat, so to speak, of the sideshow tent. I think I've heard enough tonight, I interjected, my hand pressing against my queasy stomach. What are you saying? 
asked Quisser. You remember them, don't you? The gas station carnivals. Maybe just a faint memory. I was sure you would be the one to know about them. I think I can say, I said to Quisser, I've heard enough of your gas station carnival story to know what it's all about. What do you mean, what it's all about? asked Quisser, who was still looking over at the small stage across the room. Well, for one thing, your later memories, your purported memories of that showman character. You were about to tell me that throughout your childhood you repeatedly saw this figure at various times and in various places. Perhaps you saw him in the distance of a schoolyard, standing with his back to you. Or you saw him on the other side of a busy street, but when you crossed the street he wasn't there any longer. Something like that, yes. And you were then going to tell me that lately you've been seeing this figure, or faint suggestions of this figure, sketchy reflections in store windows along the sidewalk, flashing glimpses in the rearview mirror of your car. It's very much like one of your stories. In some ways it is, I said, and in some ways it isn't. You feel that if you ever see the showman figure turn his head around to look at you, that something terrible will happen, most likely that you'll perish on the spot from some kind of monumental shock. Yes, agreed Quisser, an unsustainable horror. But I haven't told you the strangest part. You're right that lately I have had glimpses of that figure, and I did see him during my childhood, outside of the sideshow tent, I mean. But the strangest part is that I remember seeing him in other places even before I first saw him at the gas station carnivals. This is just my point, I said. What is? That there are no gas station carnivals. There never were any gas station carnivals. Nobody remembers them because they never existed. The whole idea is preposterous. But my parents were there with me. Exactly. Your dead father and your mentally incompetent mother. Do you remember ever discussing with them your vacation experiences at these special gas stations with the carnival supposedly annexed to them? No, I don't. That's because you never went to any such places with them. Think about how ludicrous it all sounds. That there should be filling stations out in the sticks that entice customers with free admission to broken-down carnivals. It's all so ridiculous. Miniature carnival rides? Gas station attendants doubling as sideshow performers? Not the showman, interrupted Quisser. He was never a gas station attendant. No, of course he wasn't a gas station attendant, because he was a delusion. The whole thing is an outrageous delusion, but it's also a very particular type of delusion. And what type would that be? asked Quisser, who was still sneaking glances at the stage area across the room of the Crimson Cabaret. It's not some type of common psychological delusion, if that's what you were thinking I was about to say. I have no interest at all in such things, but I am very interested when someone is suffering from a magical delusion. Even more precisely, I am interested in delusions that are a result of art magic. And do you know how long you've been under the influence of this art magic delusion? You've lost me, said Quisser. It's simple, I said. How long have you imagined all this nonsense about the gas station carnivals, and specifically about this character you describe as the showman? I guess it would be more or less absurd at this point to insist to you that I've seen this figure since childhood, even if that's exactly how it seems and that's exactly what I remember. Of course it would be absurd, because you're definitely delusional. So I'm delusional about the showman, but you're not delusional about, what do you call it? Art magic. For as long as you've been a victim of this particular art magic, this is how long you've been delusional about the gas station carnivals and all related phenomena. And how long is that? asked Quisser. Since you humiliated the Crimson Woman by calling her a deluded no talent, I told you that she had connections you knew absolutely nothing about. I'm talking about something from my childhood, something I've remembered my entire life. You're talking about a matter of days. That's because a matter of days is exactly the term that you've been delusional. Don't you see that through her art magic she has caused you to suffer from the worst kind of delusion, which might be called a retroactive delusion? And it's not only you who's been afflicted in the past days and weeks and even months. Everyone around here has sensed the threat of this art magic for some time now. 
I'm beginning to think that I've found out about it too late myself, much too late. You know what it is to suffer from a delusion of the retroactive type, but do you know what it's like to be the victim of a severe stomach disorder? I've been sitting here in the Crimson Woman's Club drinking mint tea served by a waitress who is the Crimson Woman's friend, thinking that mint tea is just the thing for my stomach when it very well may be aggravating my condition or even causing it to transform, in accordance with the principles of art magic, into something more serious and more strange. But the Crimson Woman is not the only one practicing this art magic. It's happening everywhere around here. It drifted in unexpectedly like a fog at sea, and so many of us are becoming lost in it. Look at the faces in this room and then tell me that you alone are the victim of a horrible art magic. The Crimson Woman has quite a few adversaries, just as she is connected with powerful allies. How can I say exactly who they are? Some group specializing in art magic, no doubt, but I can't just say, with a fatuous certainty, yes, it must be some particular gang of Illuminati or esoteric scientists, as so many have begun styling themselves these days. But it all sounds like one of your stories, Quisser protested. Of course it does. Don't you think she knows that? But I'm not the one with that grotesque yarn about the gas station carnivals and the sideshow tent with a small stage not unlike the stage on the opposite side of this room. You can't keep your eyes off it. I can see that and so can the other people around the room. And I know what you think you're seeing over there. Assuming you know what you're talking about, said Quisser, who was now forcing himself to look away from the stage area across the room, what am I supposed to do about it? You can start by keeping your eyes off that stage across the room. There's nothing you can see over there except an art magic delusion. There is nothing necessarily fatal or permanent about the affliction. But you must believe that you will recover, just as you would if you were suffering from some non-fatal physical disease. Otherwise, these delusions may turn into something far more deadly, on either a physical level or a psychic level, or both. Take my advice, as someone who dabbles in tales of extraordinary doom, and walk away from all of this madness. There are enough fatalities of a mundane sort. Find a quiet place and wait for one of them to carry you off. I could now see that the intense conviction carried by my words had finally had its effect on Quisser. His gaze was no longer drawn toward the small stage on the opposite side of the room, but was directed full upon me. He did remain somewhat distraught in the face of the truth about his delusion, yet he seemed to have settled down considerably. I lit another of my mild cigarettes and glanced around the room, not looking for anything or anyone in particular, but merely gauging the atmosphere. The tobacco smoke drifting through the club was so much thicker, the amber light several shades darker, and the sound of raindrops still played against the black-painted windows of the Crimson Cabaret. I was now back in the cabin of that old ship as it was being cast about in a vicious storm at sea, utterly insecure in its bearings and profoundly threatened by uncontrollable forces. Quisser excused himself to go to the restroom, and his form passed across my field of vision like a shadow through dense fog. I have no idea how long Quisser was gone from the table. My attention became fully absorbed by the other faces in the club and the deep anxiety they betrayed to me, an anxiety that was not of the natural existential sort, but one that was caused by peculiar concerns of an uncanny nature. What a season is upon us, these faces seem to say, and no doubt their voices would have spoken directly of certain peculiar concerns had they not been intimidated into weird equivocations and double entendres by the fear of falling victim to the same kind of unnatural affliction that had made so much trouble in the mind of the art critic, Stuart Quisser. Who would be next? What could a person say these days, or even think, without feeling the dread of repercussion from powerfully connected groups and individuals? I could almost hear their voices asking, Why here? Why now? But of course they could have just as easily been asking, Why not here? Why not now? It would not occur to this crowd that there were no special rules involved. It would not occur to them, even though there were a crowd of imaginative artists, that the whole thing was simply a matter of random, purposeless terror that converged upon a particular place at a particular time for no particular reason. 
On the other hand, it would also not have occurred to them that they might have wished it all upon themselves, that they might have had a hand in bringing certain powerful forces and connections into our district simply by wishing them to come. They might have wished and wished for an unnatural evil to fall upon them, but, for a while at least, nothing happened. Then the wishing stopped. The old wishes were forgotten, yet at the same time gathered in strength, distilling themselves into a potent formula, who can say, until one day the terrible season began. Because had they really told the truth, this artistic crowd might also have expressed what a sense of meaning, although of a negative sort, not to mention the vigorous thrill, although of an excruciating type, this season of unnatural evil had brought to their lives. What does it mean to be alive except to court disaster and suffering at every moment? For every diversion, for every thrill our born nature requires in this carnival world, even to the point of apocalypse, there are risks to be taken. No one is safe, not even art magicians or esoteric scientists, who are the most deluded among us because they are the most tempted by amusements of an uncanny and unnatural kind fumbling as any artist or scientist does with the inherent chaos of things. It was during the moments that I was looking at all the faces in the Crimson Cabaret and thinking my own thoughts about those faces that a shadow again passed across my foggy field of vision. While I expected to find that the shadow was Quisser, my table companion for that evening, on the way back from his trip to the restroom, I instead found myself confronted by the waitress who Quisser had claimed was so loyal to the Crimson Woman. She asked if I wanted to order yet another cup of mint tea, saying it in exactly these words, yet another cup of mint tea, trying not to become irritated by her queerly sarcastic tone of voice, which would only have further aggravated my already queasy stomach. I answered that I was just about to leave for the night. Then I added that perhaps my friend wanted to drink yet another glass of wine, pointing across the table to indicate the empty wine glass Quisser had left behind when he excused himself to use the restroom. But there was no empty wine glass across the table. There was only my empty cup of mint tea. I immediately accused the waitress of taking away the empty wine glass while I was distracted by my reverie upon the faces in the Crimson Cabaret but she denied ever serving any glass of wine to anyone at my table, insisting that I had been alone from the moment I arrived at the club and sat down at the table across the room from the small stage area. After a thorough search of the restroom, I returned and tried to find someone else in the club who had seen the art critic Quisser talking to me at great length about his gas station carnivals, but all of them said that they had seen no one of the kind. Even Quisser himself, when I tracked him down the next day to a hole-in-the-wall art gallery, maintained that he had not seen me the night before. He said that he had spent the entire evening at home by himself, claiming that he had suffered some indisposition, some bug, he said, from which he had since fully recovered. When I called him a liar, he stepped right up to me as we stood in the middle of that hole-in-the-wall art gallery, and in a tense whisper he said that I should watch my words. I was always shooting off my mouth, he said, and in the future I should use more discretion in what I said and to whom I said it. He then asked me if I really thought it was wise to open my mouth at a party and call someone a deluded no-talent. There were certain persons, he said, that had powerful connections, and I, of all people, he said, should know better, considering my awareness of such things and the way I displayed this awareness in the stories I wrote. Not that I disagreed with what you said about you-know-who, he said, but I would not have made such an open declaration. You humiliated her. And these days such a thing can be very perilous, if you know what I mean. Of course, I did know what he meant, though I did not yet understand why he was now saying these words to me, rather than I to him. Was it not enough, I later thought, that I was still suffering a terrible stomach disorder? Did I also have to bear the burden of another's delusion? But even this explanation eventually fell to pieces upon further inquiry. The stories multiplied about the night of that party, Accounts proliferated among my acquaintances and peers concerning exactly who had committed the humiliating offense and even who had been the offended party. 
Why are you telling me these things? The crimson woman said to me when I proffered my deepest apologies. I barely know who you are. And besides, I've got enough problems of my own. That bitch of a waitress here at the club has taken down all my paintings and replaced them with her own. All of us had problems, it seemed, whose sources were untraceable, crossing over one another like the trajectories of countless raindrops in a storm, blending to create a fog of delusion and counter-delusion. Powerful forces and connections were undoubtedly at play, yet they seemed to have no faces and no names, and it was anybody's guess what we, a crowd of deluded no-talents, could have possibly done to offend them. We had been caught up in a season of hideous magic from which nothing could offer us deliverance. More and more, I found myself returning to those memories of gas station carnivals, seeking an answer in the twilight of remote rural areas where miniature merry-go-rounds and ferris wheels lay broken in a desolate landscape. But there is no one here who will listen even to my most abject apologies, least of all the showman, who may be waiting behind any door, even that leading to the restroom of the Crimson Cabaret and any room that I enter may become a sideshow tent where I must take my place upon a rickety old bench on the verge of collapse. Even now, the showman stands before my eyes. His stiff red hair moves a little toward one shoulder, as if he is going to turn his gaze upon me, and moves back again. Then his head moves a little toward the other shoulder in this never-ending game of horrible peek a -boo. I can only sit and wait, knowing that one day he will turn full around, step down from his stage, and claim me for the abyss I have always feared. Perhaps then I will discover what it was I did, what any of us did, to deserve this fate.